Well, let's pray. Father God, I do thank you, Lord, this morning. What a privilege to be in your house. What a privilege to be. What a privilege to be a believer, to be a son of the Most High God, to be loved. What a privilege to be free. What a privilege. Lord, I just give you praise and glory for all you're doing today. You are a mighty and an awesome God. And we give you such, such praise. Thank you for what you've done already this morning and what you're going to be doing. Lord, I just give you all the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I'm going to teach you something very, very important right now. Because, well... We just learned it kind of a thing. Not really. We've been doing this for years. If you expect to grow something, you know, really pretty much you, you get what you expect. Your expectations are kind of like where you're going to go, in, especially in the spirit realm. What you, where your faith is, is what you're going to get. Now, that's kind of a harsh thing to say because if what your faith is is what you're going to get, then what are you going to get? You know, we have prayer before church, and one thing I've, I've told people, pray what you want to happen. What do you want to see happen during a church service? What do you want to see happen? Well, if it was totally dependent upon what you prayed, what would happen during church service today? Okay kind of one of those deals. Well, I've learned a long time ago that sowing and reaping is a very major part of the Bible. And we're going to be talking about a little bit of that today. But really, before we get into that, sowing and reaping is such a strong, strong, strong principle law that God's put, a, put aside that um, it always works all the time, every time, no matter what, no matter where, no matter when, no matter how, no matter who. It always works. What I'm doing right now is I'm sowing into the church. This series is just sowing. I don't expect, really, I have very little expectations of people getting it. Because, like I said from the very beginning, from verse, the first time we had this series, first time we started is what? Is that this isn't for you, necessarily. This is for me. I need to teach this to get the revelation of it. Now, I want to let you know what's happening. A little progress report. It's working. It's thumping me rather severely. Amen. Now, if you get something out of it and it helps your life, praise God, okay? But really, what we're doing is we're sowing this into our spirits. You say, you know, I'm not grasping the whole thing. Well, neither am I. <laughs> okay. We're, we're, none of us grasp at all. Do you understand? So what does it mean? It means that... Uh, we're, we're letting this loose in the spirit realm. And it's going to affect us. We are sowing. Will we get a harvest from this? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I'm just reminding you about how that works, okay? So that being said, a little disclaimer. Don't you just hate disclaimers at the beginning? I just like, you know, buckle your seatbelts. Here we go. We're talking about abiding. Okay, it's been the series. This is number five. By the way, for those of you who want to know, number six will be next week, and then it's over. You say, you're kidding. Did you cover it all? No. <laughs> did not. Fact is, I should tell you about a little conversation we had this week, because I laughed so hard, I almost, I almost couldn't breathe. My wife, bless her little soul, she's not here to defend herself. See? <laughs> <laughs> Give her the CD. doesn't bother me any. I mean, I'll pay. Trust me. But no, really. She, I was on, I was studying. And I'm trying to get this stuff together. And usually when I study, you don't see much. I'm just sitting there. It's just God, me, and, and just working. And it's just a little, very quiet, very nothing. And I freaked out a little bit. And she says, what? You know, because I'm, I'm oh, ugh! over there. And she says, what? I says, Look what it says here in 1 John. And she said, no. <laughs> what do you mean, no? She says, no, not that I'm not going to look, but no, you can't use it. I says, excuse me? She says, no. 
from what you said from the beginning that you wanted to catch just this little thing, this, this, this is where you're heading. No, you can't use 1 John. So I am not, I'm not able to get into 1 John. If I did, we would be going down major bunny trails, six foot tall, big ears. We would be chasing. I'm not going to get into 1 John. I had at least seven opportunities to branch off into 1 John just for this morning. And my wife said, no. I'm being an obedient young man. <laughs> well, man. <laughs> we'll go with that. You didn't have to agree so readily and verbally. Come on. Okay. Here we go. Abides. Abiding. Abide. Word is the Greek word meno. It means to stay permanently. Not visit and leave. This is, this is the one that's getting me. It's this not visit and leave stuff. It's to stay. I'm not... To, to not visit and leave. To live there, house there, stay there. Totally connected. Well, then we started going into, we started into um, John chapter 14. And in John chapter 14, Jesus starts ta telling the disciples that he's leaving and he's freaking them all out. And this is just right after, at the very end of the Passover Seder. Okay, right at Pesach. And they're just poof, sitting there getting ready to go to Gethsemane. And he does chapter 14. And 14 is just, we, we took two weeks to go over chapter 14. Where Jesus said, when you see me, you see the Father. Why? He says, because I am in the Father. The Father is in me. You are in me. I am in you. The Father is in you. Do we understand that? Nope. No. We have a hard time with this. I am in him. He is in me. Permanently. I mean, this, is a, this is a solid, solid thing that they have established. Jesus says, it's the Father's words. It's the Father's works. He's doing it through me. It's not me. It's him. It's the Father. Seen me, seen the Father. We got to ask him the question, is it true in your life that see you, see Jesus? When somebody walks away from you, do they know that they've been in the presence of Jesus Christ? Or they know they've been in the presence of you? See, and this is what I'm trying to get, get a grip on, is to know how to let the hymnness of him come out through my meanness. <laughs> What's really scary is you understood that sentence. Yeah, see, we're on the right wavelength. Scary, huh? Yeah, okay. I want to see him through me. And then Jesus told the disciples, I am in you and you are in me, just like I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And they're going, I don't understand. And then we got into the baptism, not the baptism, but the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. How the Holy Spirit lives in us. And what the scripture has to say about that. And we did the, a little brief foray into Romans chapter 8, where we talked about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Folks, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is still right up there with, we don't get it. If we knew that the Holy Spirit was totally living in us every second of the day, do you think we would act different? See, so the whole change here is looking on the outward and seeing if we understand something on the inward. Now, we could take anybody here, any brave volunteer, and stand you right up in front of up here and examine your life. Volunteers? Boy, that's a, just an unresponsive crowd, I tell you. <laughs> we could look at the fruit and see how much abiding of the Holy Spirit there is. Can't we? We can look at our own lives. And see, well, I'm not into trying to just walk around being judgmental on people and saying, oh, you're not much of a Christian, are you? But what do, are we? that's not our plan. Our plan is to do the self-inspection, not the, the self-imposed, I am ruler, sheriff of all the spiritual people over here, and I'm going to inform you of what's wrong in your life, and you better shape up. I grew up with that. It didn't work, by the way. It's called legalism. And it just doesn't fly. Religion in its fine points. We have that all the way down through history. And yet, what is it that we're really looking for? It's that relationship with Jesus Christ. That one-on-one, -on -one, knowing him, knowing who he is, how he touches my life moment by moment every day. And that song. That's one of those ones that I'm surprised I could sing through that song. It just, it's good. For me. I'm yours. Set apart for you. I'm yours. Oh, mercy. 
do we know it? Well, then we started last week. We started with, he is the true vine with true life in it. And the father is the vine dresser, Georgos, the George. Okay. He's the, it actually comes from two words, earth and worker. So it's actually the earth worker, the dirt worker, the farmer. Okay. The George. We got the word George right from that Greek word, Georgos. Okay. That's my daddy. My daddy was a George in more ways than one. He was definitely there. The pruning process. We started getting into that last week. And boy, we're going to get more into it. Everybody is glad to see that I do not have the clippers up here this morning. The fruit is the goal of the vine, is to have fruit on it. And we're going to be getting more and more in that today. No fruit or less fruit. Where do you come? Um, kind of a fascinating deal. Walking through a vineyard. You can walk through a vineyard and you can see which vines have a basket under them that has no fruit in it, which ones have a little fruit in them, which ones have more fruit in them, and which ones are busting the bucket with fruit. Why? What's the difference? What's the difference in each vine? That's the difference between us, is where, where do we go with this thing? The whole prospect is, it's the vine dresser who makes us fit to produce fruit. The vine dresser, he's gotta make us fit to produce that fruit. So we gotta, we gotta work on that. And we found out that the heart is the thing that we're talking about, the pruning of the heart. What is in the heart that is sucking energy away from the vine? What is in the heart that is sucking the energy away from what the vine wants to do? Okay, well, okay. Let me just read this real quickly, verses one through six of John chapter 15. And not too quickly, because I, I learned something that I wanna share with you. This is, this is kind of fun. You'll like this one, Sandy. Okay, this is for you, okay? We're very interactive here for those of you who are visiting you're under, wow, what, what, you'll pick on everybody in the audience? Yeah, I tend to, yes, it's okay. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch of me not bearing fruit, he takes away. You ready for this? This is kind of a fun, fun thing. I found out the word there for takes away. This is the only place it's translated takes away. Everywhere else, it's translated to lift it up. Every branch of me not bearing fruit, he lifts it up. Meaning what? Well, see, if you go to a vine and you're walking along the vine, you'll find that there's branches that have fallen down into the dirt. And vines that drop down in the dirt get all dirty and they don't get any sunlight on them and they produce absolutely nothing. So the idea is for the vine dresser to come along and they actually come up with a bucket and they clean off the vine, clean all the soil and dirt off of the, the leaves and everything, clean the thing, and then tie it. They lift it up and tie it in the, on the the the... There's a word there. Trellis. It disappeared. That word just disappeared. Okay. And they tie it to the trellis so they can get air and it can get light and it can grow fruit. The vine dresser comes along, cleans it up and ties it up higher. He lifts it up. It's not all of this is the negative kind of, you're all going to die if you don't do it right. I don't want to get into that. Okay. There's a, there's a thing that the vine dresser sees value in you and wants fruit to come out. Okay. Every branch of me not bearing fruit, he lifts up. And everyone bearing fruit, he prunes, so that it may bear more fruit. You are already pruned because of the word which I have spoken to you. Remain in me. Now, this is the Greek word, meno. Abide. Stay. Remain in me, and I in you. As the branch is not able to bear fruit of itself unless it remain in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one abiding, remaining, staying, the one abiding in me, and I in him, this one bears much fruit. Because apart from me, you are not able to execute nothing. Unless one remains in me, he is cast out as the branch and is dried up, and they gather and throw them into a fire, and they are burned. What we're trying to get at here is where I'm abiding, how I'm staying in. Now, when I sit in a ministry session and I'm talking with somebody, uh, what has been kind of fascinating the last couple of weeks is to sit there and have this running conversation in a greater depth than I've ever had with Jesus before. Much, much greater. And the idea is, it's his, if it's his works, um, right here, uh, it says, because apart from me, you are not able to execute nothing. I want to execute something. I want to do something. If I want to see effect in this person's life, guess what? I'm going to have to be completely and totally abiding in the vine. 
During this session, I've got to have some abiding going on here, huh? I've got to be connected. Why? Because I can't do anything in myself. And the more I get the idea where I can do something in myself, guess what? The worse I can do. The worse I can do. You know what burnout usually is? Burnout. is one of those little things in a Christian's life. Whereas they've been growing in the Lord and growing in the Lord and growing in the Lord. And their sufficiency and their ability to do stuff grows more and more. The first part of your Christian life, you are so dependent upon Jesus, you can hardly even stand yourself. You know that nothing works. You're just going to hear just right. And then pretty soon you become more efficient. You become more able. And you start doing stuff. And you'll find you can do an awful lot of your Christian life without the relationship with Jesus. How well is that working out for you? As soon as you get to the point where you're able to handle it without him, they call that burnout because you will go <laughs> just a puff of smoke and a hearty high ho nothing. That's burnout. I don't want to burn out. We have found that people who tend to find out why they're doing what they're doing will not burn out. When they're doing it totally because they love Jesus, there is no burnout. When they're doing it between him and them, Jesus didn't get burnt out, and you think he was under pressure for three and a half years? I think so. Constant, constant pressure. He spent a lot of time in the Father's presence. Why? Because he knew that if it wasn't by the relationship and the Father doing it, he had nothing. Anybody here relating to what I'm talking about this morning? Okay. That's verse 6, 1 through 6. One through six. Unless one remains in me, is cast out as a branch and is dried up. There does come a time when a branch gets just so stubborn where a branch says, I'm not going to do what you want to do. The vine dresser says, fine, the goal is the fruit. You're not going to produce fruit? Fine. We're not going to allow you to continue to suck off energy off the vine from other branches. You will be eliminated. And this is true, folks. This is a, a truth. I just want to say this one time real quick and easy. There is aspect of this. If a person will not stay in the vine, you plug out, you start getting out where there's no fruit on you, guess what? He will cut the fruit. And I just want to make sure you hear that, and then we're going to go on. I'm not going to be talking today about all that, but there is that aspect. Okay? I won't get stuck there. But that's true. Why do I say that? Out of guilt, to guilt you, to fear you, make you fear? No. Just because it says in the passage, I just want to cover it. Okay? It's true. I don't want to be cut off. Anybody here, you know, kind of agree that you don't want to be cut off? I don't want to get cut off, okay? That's a good deal. And this one has nothing to do with lifting up. <laughs> this has nothing to do with tying it better on the trestle, tre trellis. I can't say that thing, you know? Okay. But it's talking about it's dead. It's done. And cut off and thrown away. Okay. Here's the deal. Got yourself here a little grapevine. And this is exactly what he was looking at. And it was dark. I understand it was after after sundown, right? Because that's, you have to, because you don't start Pesach until sundown. Hey, what a concept. And then sat in there and, and ate a lot of food, drank a lot of wine, and had a very, very interesting time. And now they're walking out with torches, whatever, and they're seeing this stuff. And they're walking through all this stuff on their way to Gethsemane, okay? Um, because at the end of chapter 14, he said, let's rise up and go out of here. And they're on their way. And he says, I am the vine. I am the true vine. So they're looking at saying things just like this. Well, there's the vine, and uh, looky there, there's a branch. What's the difference between a vine and a branch? The vine is bigger. <laughs> really, if you took a chunk of vine, and you took a chunk of branch, and you opened them up and looked at them, you know what the difference is? And not much. Why? Because he's telling us, he's telling us, you're made of the same stuff I am. Well, aren't you? Are you born of the Spirit just like he was? See? Yeah, there's parts of you that are just, you're born again. You're just made of his stuff. <laughs> there's no difference. It's kind of a fascinating deal. We had a vine on the back fence of our house in Golden. We knew nothing about growing grapes. You know what our, our idea of growing grapes was? We just looked back there and see if anything was hanging on, and if so, we went back and cut it off. That's not being a good vine dresser. They weren't our grapes anyway. We had to ask permission because the guy on the other side grew the, the vine. And that vine went through the, 
And so he told us whatever grows on our side, we can have. But he didn't prune our side either. He didn't take care of our side either. Kind of fascinating. We watched how these things grew. Well, there's the vine, there's the branch. Life from the vine goes through the branch, and what happens? Outward expression of fruit. Now, we're going to see this several times today. Okay, life through the vine goes through the branch, outward expression of fruit. Meaning what? What's the job of the branch? To be the channel between the vine and the fruit. <laughs> okay? The more you're branchish, the better your fruit's going to be. The less you are able to be a good branch, the less your fruit will be. Okay? So it's going to, we're going to start in John chapter 15, verse 7 today. We went through 1 through 6 last week. Here's verse 7. Okay? Here we go. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, whatever you desire, you will ask and it shall happen to you. Now, let's get part of this out of the road real quickly here. The problem is, answered prayer seemed to be a consistent theme. Does that, is that a consistent theme with you? Anybody here interested in answered prayer? How come your prayer isn't answered? How many times have you prayed and it seems like there was nothing? Anybody? You got the right crowd? Hmm, me too. What's up with that? Especially when your sister says, hey, whatever you desire, you ask, and it shall happen to you. We like that part of it. It's the if part of the beginning that we don't really get. Okay? Now, why am I saying that this is a consistent theme? Well, they seem to be something they really wanted, didn't know about. Well, same with us. We <laughs> really know. Because in chapter 14, we covered this. In chapter 14, it said this. 12 through 14, it says, Indeed, I tell you truly, the one believing into me, the works which I do, that one shall do, and greater than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you may ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, it's just the same thing. They're talking about prayer. Ask anything. Cool. It'll be done. And then we sit there, we ask anything, and nothing's done. We're missing a part. The part we're missing is the most important part, okay? The key is believing into him. The being in him is the key. Everything I pray in his name, in him. See, this isn't about my wants. This is one of those ones where I jump right into 1 John chapter 5 that I'm not going to quote to you right now. <sighs> but trust me, it's in there, and it's really good. <laughs> but the thing is, in him is doing what? What he wants. Praying what he wants is the key. Okay, believing into him. In him by relationship. Whatever you ask in my name. In my name. Now, for those of you who were brave souls and kind of hung around a certain series that we did here called Covenant... In his name means what? What's it mean to be in his name? To have covenant with him to where you've died to self and you're living for the other, right? Isn't that what covenant is, is living for the other person? Yep. Now, again, we know more than we're living. Amen. See, right now I could stop and we could have ourselves an altar call. We could have some real, real fun time right here. Why? Because covenant is the death to independent living if I am dead to me then I can ask in his name because I have an exchange of names isn't that kind of an amazing deal if I was in covenant with Miranda let's cancel that if I was in covenant with Bai <laughs> that could get sticky you know where hey. if I was in covenant with Bai you know what we would actually do we would actually exchange names my name would be Lee Bai and his name would be Bai Lee you would know from our name that we're in covenant together. We have exchanged names. Now, I have his name. Therefore, when I come to doing an, an action, I can be there as if I were by. That's the truth of a covenant. I can do stuff as if I were that person. Now, how are you in Christ? Are you in him? Because if you're in him and by covenant, then when you pray, you are praying as if you were Jesus himself. 
When you're praying and you're praying only what Jesus really wants, what's going to happen? Huh, it's going to happen. So that you say, well, why aren't some of these prayers being answered? Why aren't they being done? Well, let's go back to the source a little bit. Let's get back into, is this prayer truly as if Jesus were praying it? Am I in him or am I in myself? In chapter 16, which we're not going to go to, I mean, we are now, but we're not going to cover all of chapter 16. We're not going to do a verse by verse through the last part of John. But in John chapter 16, verse 22, 23 and 24, it says this. In that day, you will ask me nothing. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, you will receive that your joy may be full. And this is little bit interesting here. They needed a greater relationship with the Father. Jesus says, I am leaving and I'm going to the Father. It's not about asking me. It's about asking the Father in my name. You need to have a greater relationship with the Father because I'm booking out of here. He's just talking to 11 guys right there that for three and a half years have had a, an intense relationship with him. And he says, I'm out of here. I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. I'm done. I'm booking. He said, but you need to have a relationship with the Father. Just like I had a relationship with the Father. You need to have a relationship with the Father. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the Father, and He's going to send the Holy Spirit to you, and He's going to teach you everything that I've said. He's going to teach you everything else that you know. It's going to be a total relationship, and you're powered by God to have a relationship with the Father. That's real prayer. Kind of like burns the religion out of that, doesn't it? They could approach the Father as Jesus. How? By being in covenant? Do we have a covenant with Him? Man, in just a few short weeks here, we're going to be having Passover. And how much covenant language is in Passover? Are you kidding? Piles. We're going to find out more and more. If you've not been through a Passover, oh, have I have, I have a good suggestion. Okay? It's a wonderful evening, and it takes all evening. It's about 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock. Okay? But we eat and we eat well except for the horseradish I remember the year that somebody said well you're supposed to have fresh ground horseradish I'll do that for you and they walked in with the stuff with it was all sealed and everything and got ready to put that on the plates <laughs> popped open that lid and the entire room's eyes started watering <laughs> well, I went oh god and we're going to have to and we're going to See, if you do that, that keeps the preaching very short before the time, because then you get there. You get. And my dad was walking from table to table saying afterwards, you going to eat that? Can I, can I have that, please? <laughs> my dad liked horseradish. Okay. In his name. We're going to find out more and more and more. What's it going to be like to be in his name during Passover at the end of it? They just got done with that Passover, and he said what? This is my blood, which is shed for you, which is the new covenant whoa man and they're going new covenant and they're blinking you know new covenant with whom with the father this is the new covenant my blood shed so that you can have covenant with the father jeez it gets who got me started on covenant I did what's up with that okay he says and you will receive so that your joy may be full there's a joy factor in this See, the thing is, is this, when you become more one with Jesus and then you start asking the Father to do stuff in Jesus' name, what's going to happen? You see, your joy factor, because there's a fulfillment in this thing. When we ask for things in our name, for the things we want, do we truly get joy if we get it? See, we're talking about a happiness thing, not a joy thing. He says, pray that, do this, your joy will be full. This is too important. We'll get back to that in just a second. So now back to John chapter 15, verse 7. Okay, back in 15, 7. Now I, got, I'm gonna get, I did that to get the prayer thing out of the road so we can look at the relationship thing now. Here we are. If, well, that's just a nasty place to start. If, I love big words in the Bible. The big words of the Bible. If is one of the biggest words in the whole scripture. Yeah. If is a huge word. Huge. If 
implies a whole bunch of stuff. I don't even if implies means is the right word. It means that there's a possibility of not. Okay? If you remain in me, shows that there's a, there's a possibility that you're not going to remain in him. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, whatever you desire, you will ask and it'll happen to you. If you remain in me, if is a huge word. The issue here is in the abiding. And watch these, watch these words. If you abide, remain, stay, connect, get in me. Now this whole thing we've had, we've been talking about this identity thing about taking, killing the old self and putting on the new self and stepping into Christ and being in him. This is crucial, so crucial. And it's becoming more and more crucial in my mind. I'm seeing it on a regular basis in him. Can I stay in him? I keep saying that same sentence over. And I'm sure you're tired of it now, but in him, it doesn't quite compute. I understand, but I don't understand. The issue is abiding. If you abide in me, okay, there's the person of Jesus Christ and I'm staying in him. I'm abiding, living, stuck right there, staying in him. That's one direction. And my words, abide, stay, stick in you. Now, this is where I'm, I'm, I'm this is why, one of the reasons why I'm preaching this is it to get this understanding that it's not enough for me to be in Christ, but I have to have his words abiding in me. In other words, obeying him. Relationship is one thing, but it's got to translate out, doesn't it? It's got to translate out into something that we're doing. Okay, it's got to. I gotta, it's got to be a both way thing. It's one thing to be in Christ, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I'm in. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. This is all that good stuff. Yeah, but there's got to be that stepping out. It's got to be the, the commands and doing them. Okay, you abide in me. If we are one then we get more. And my words abiding in you, it's got to go the other direction. What is that? The words is the pruning, isn't it? The words is the pruning part. We don't like this part. No. Yeah, what's up with that, right? <laughs> You'd think that we'd pick up on this, that it'd be a good thing. Is it a good thing? It is a marvelous thing. Does it feel good? Never. Can you tell the difference between God's pruning and God's discipline? They both feel like pain. But one is because there's sin in your life. What happens? The pain stops when you quit the sinning. <laughs> you, know, you deal with the thing. That's just discipline. God's saying, don't do this. Yeah, okay. What happens when the pain continues? What if it's not discipline? What if it's pruning? You see, how are you going to know when it's over? You're not. You don't know how long it's going to take to prune. If you submit to the pruning process, it goes a lot quicker. But what happens when it takes three years of pain? And you're sitting there going, what's this? God's going, hey, quit wiggling. <laughs> we'll cut this thing off. <laughs> Anybody here ever try to give a shot to a three-year-old? I remember in uh, Russia, Kimberly got a boil. And she was three, something like that. We had a nurse there. Audrey and took it to her. She says, you know, this needs to be lanced because it was all, it was gross and it was painful. And she said, uh, and she, she tried to really be nice to Kimberly and she was all really friendly and Kimberly was scared to half out of her mind. And Kimberly, I don't know if you've noticed, but she's a little athletic. She's always been a little bit of a brute, you know, a lot of strength. Here she was. And this thing's on the inside of her arm. Now, she told me, Audrey told me, says, here's what we're going to do. And we wrapped Kimberly in a sheet. Pulled that thing tight. And so from this armpit down, she was a mummy. But this arm couldn't be in the sheet because we had to get to it. So what was my job? 
with all that was within me to hold that arm still. Who would beat up a poor child like this? Because her, her life was on the line. I mean, this thing, this, you can't get, let that infection just go and run rampant. It needed to be dealt with. And so we had to actually cut open this thing, drain it with a three-year-old. Now, how much anesthetic did we have on the field in Russia? Not much. We gave her some. And, she, and I had her head and I had her arm and I talked to her and we prayed with her and we, we talked and laughed and did everything that we could. I had the business end. A friend of Audrey's that was there had the other end. He had her legs and was laying across her, holding her down. And we held her down and Audrey was able to do this surgery. Was that fun? No, was it needed? Yes. Absolutely. What happened? I don't even know if she remembers it. I don't think she does. Well, you say, remember? It should have been, I mean, come on, there's three people attacking her with sharp instruments. You'd think that'd be traumatic. No, not when the whole presence of the Lord was there. We were praying and praying and praying and we're talking tongues all over the place because there's no way to, in your understanding to know what to pray. We had a very good time of worship. But pruning is not funny, but it is valuable. It is valuable. Verse 8. In this, my father is glorified that you should bear much fruit and you will be disciples to me. Okay. I don't have time to back up and explain all this. So that those of you who haven't heard all this teaching about you being the glory of the Lord, you're kind of at a loss here. But understand this. In this, my father is glorified. How do you glorify? Okay. If you're in Christ, who is in Christ? The, the bad soul you or the you that God intended the you that God intended the you that God intended it says in 2 Corinthians is the glory of the Lord you are the glory of the Lord well the glory of the Lord the real me the real me when I'm in Christ what am I doing well this is really fun the glory of who we are is shining back on the Father to glorify him is to shine who we are back on the Father. That is what pleases him. What pleases him is when we are who we are supposed to be. Am I making sense? Is anybody following me at all here? <laughs> okay. And he says that you should bear much fruit. In this my Father is glorified that you should bear much fruit. And this will make more sense as we go. But much and greater fruit is the real goal of the vine and the vine dresser, isn't it? And then he says, you'll be little Christ. And then you will be disciples to me. What is a disciple? A disciple is one who looks like the one who is discipling him. Being little Christ. What does the word Christian mean? Just like a Martian is a little person from Mars, a representative from Mars, a Christian is a little person from Christ who is a representative of Christ. A Christian is a little Christ. And some of you are very much aliens and just, you know, and... Uh, Hey, <laughs> don't get me my geek started this morning. Okay, but let's go on. Verse nine says this. As the father loved me, I also love you. Continue in my love. Now, here's the other big word out of the scripture. There's two big words, if and as. As, huh, as exactly like in the very same exact manner the Father loved me, I also loved you. In the exact same manner the Father loved me, I loved you. Okay? First command before the second command. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. This, this, this loving thing is very, very important here. This works for Jesus. <laughs> That's a good line. This works for Jesus. Okay, he got the love of the Father, right? Water pipes get wet. Huh? Huh? Okay. This works for Jesus. Works the same for us. But we need to abide. Notice that word? See, it said continue. Let's go back a little bit. See? What did say continue? I also love you. Continue in my love is the exact same word, and it means abide in my love. Now, this is why we're doing this whole, whole series. How do I abide in his love? Do you know that he loves you? Now, that's different. Kind of different. I mean, it's all part. But to live, 
in his love. Now, I have this running through my mind, and Mike has this set that we're doing today. You know how much that talks about in the set that we sang today? It was all over the place. I'm just trying to concentrate. Or else I'm going to be just a little blubbery mass of nothing sitting up on the stage. To abide, to stay inside his love. Can you imagine what it would be like to be completely surrounded, enveloped, completely to step inside for you are abiding in his love. See, my little pea brain goes so far, tilt. I see it, I'm touching it, but I'm not there. Abide, continue in my love. Stay in his love. I love you. Stay in my love. Abide there. And I found this to be true, that every time in when we're dealing with uh, identity issues, somebody steps into Christ, I ask one question first. The first question I always have them ask is they're standing there, you're inside Jesus Christ, and they're going, whoa. They've just taken off all this junk, and it's gone. And they got this whole new identity in Christ, and they're standing there, and they're inside Christ. And I always ask the same question. And it doesn't matter how many times, doesn't matter how many times, huh? Doesn't matter how many times you've done the identity thing, doesn't matter if you've been with me in my office and you've gone through identity thing 15 times, then 15 times I've had you ask the Lord, do you love me? As soon as you get inside him, we ask, do you love me? Why? That's the issue, isn't it? That's the issue. Okay. And then in verse 10, he goes on to say, if you keep my commands, you will continue in my love as I have kept my father's commands and continue in his love. Same word, here it is. If you keep my commands, you will abide in my love. As I have kept my Father's commands and abide in his love. Folks, when you are in Christ and you are abiding there, doing the commands and obeying them is not hard. It's not a problem. Why do we have a problem obeying the commands? Because you don't know that he loves you. You don't know that the command, I'm messing with myself, I need to sit down and listen to this. That the command that he's given you is totally for your benefit. He is there to help you. And I'll tell you, if you knew how much he loved you, would you obey him? Absolutely and quick. Why? If you know his commands, you will abide in my love. Just like we talked about in the last one. He says, how do I know you love me if you do my commands? See, it's not doing the commands proves the love. As much as, you know, you're saying if we do these commands and then we will love him because we're doing. No, no. If you loved him, you would do the commands. So our problem again is how obedient are we? Dependent totally upon how much we know he loves us. Which is dependent totally upon how much we are stepping into him. Am I making sense? This is messing with me. Big time messing with me. And we're not getting our love from somewhere else. This is so big. And I really want you to catch this. We are not to be getting our love from somebody else. Uh, if you're married, raise your hand. Okay, right people came. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> when you got married, was there any hint, any small little hint that you were getting married so that that person would take care of you? That was wrong. That was absolutely wrong on your part. To gain love. To, and, and what do you do? You push them for it. You were late for dinner. I slaved all day over this hot stove to make a good dinner for you. And it doesn't matter. You just don't love me. I... We're not even going to talk about manipulation of witchcraft that is obviously also there, but hey, you don't love me, okay, automatically. I slaved all day, cleaned out the sewers, did all this work, 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 and get done. Clean your hands, you're dirty. <laughs> what? No thank you for all the slave labor I did today? You're a mess. You smell bad. Do something about that. Uh, I can never do anything to please that woman. 
Translation, she doesn't love me. We're missing it, huh? Jesus wasn't concerned about being rejected. In fact, he knew he would be. (laughs) He was actually expecting it. Now, here he is, after three and a half years, he's telling this to these disciples, and in just a very short length of time, by the end of chapter 17, which is going to be just about an hour away from this, they're all going to run away from him. They're all going to abandon him and leave. And you want to know something? He knew they were going to. And guess what? He still loved people that he knew was going to abandon him. Can we love that spouse even though we know they're not going to love us back? Is this interesting? I think so. The father is where he gained and got his love. Now, some of you have seen this chart before. There's me. Yeah, that's where I started because that's usually where our focus is. (laughs) Right? There we go. Me. God. That's where our focus should be. Right? Okay. Somebody tell me the first and greatest command. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. We'll just stop at that one. That right there is enough to... Okay? Love the Lord your God. Where did you get the love to love Him with? Because we love Him because... There it is. Well, we love Him because He first loved us. That gave us the love to love Him with, which gave us revelation of His love for us, which gives me more love to love Him with, which gives us revelation of His love for us, which gives us more love to love Him with, which gives us more revelation of His love for us, which gives us more love to love Him with. I could do that three more times without getting a breath, so it's all just I'd be nice to you. That's important because that's where this in him is. Where do I know he loves me? I know he loves me in him. Water pipes get wet. If I'm going to channel this love, then I'm going to get the love. I'm going to know he loves me. Okay? Now, what's the second command? Love your neighbors as yourself, which is kind of one of those kind of deals because if you have truly loved the Lord, you will love yourself. How do I know when somebody does not know the love of God? When they hate themselves. You got a bad image about yourself and you're all self-pitied there. Guess what? That's not of God. Okay. What's the second command? Is love others as yourself. Boom. There they are. Loving others. What's the best thing I can tell somebody? How much God loves them. What's the best ministry I can have in their life? Is to bring them into loving God. Right? And that thing, if I can get this thing going, and I got them. There, they're good. They're going good. Now, those of you who are really highly astute and very, very intelligent will know that there's a pattern problem up here. There's an arrow missing. Because there is absolutely no place in the scripture where it commands us to get love from anybody. And folks, this is where it's at. Is that I've got to get my love from God and then I can love others. If I'm doing this to get love from somebody else, it's not love, it's actually lust. I've got to get my love from God. I've got to get it from Him. Okay? And that makes what? Covenant. Because I'm loving others without performance based on their part. I'm loving them just because of the love of the Father. And if you have a covenant in your marriage, that marriage should be totally you loving the other. You know, you've heard about this. Well, it's supposed to be a 50-50. Nah, it's a 100-0. It's a 100-0. I'm giving in this thing. Now, I, I wish I could say I was there. But every now and then, it jumps up in me. I get a little upset because Roxanne had done something. I'm going, wait, well, and the Lord says, I thought you were in covenant. <laughs> I guess I'm the only person that that ever happens to, that the Lord just, I'm just liars. Okay. Okay, here's the vine and here's the branch. Well, what happens if the love from the vine goes through the branch? The outward expression is love. How do we know that you have love? How do we know that you have love for the Father? Is when it's expressed out to me. You love me. I know you love the Father. Why? Because I'm 
I'm this wonderful son of the Father. And he loves me. Now, I'm not a perfect son of the Father. Amen. Amen. That's all good. Amen. I'm not a perfect son of the Father. Of course, you have absolutely no room to talk. Yeah, because, hey, we're not perfect, but we are loved, huh? But, yes, and if you truly love the Father, you will love me. Okay, but I'm not trying to get my love from you. John 15, 11, I have spoken these things to you that my joy may abide in you and your joy may be full. I've spoken these things that what? Joy may abide. Stay. His joy and my joy. Now look at this. Jesus says, I spoke these things to you. And what? He just said, if you love me, you'll do my commands. He says, I told you these things to you that your joy may be full. That my joy may be in you. And this is the part that I hadn't really caught. It's his joy in me. How do I get his joy? By abiding in him. When I am abiding in him, I get his joy. When I'm not abiding in him, I don't get his joy. How do I know that my joy will be fulfilled? Because the one who's abiding in him is the real me, not the fake me, not the false identities me, not, not the bad me, the who I am in Christ me. And what does that person get? I have full joy in me, the real me. How do I know when I'm not walking in who I am? There's no joy in it. And I keep trying to make happiness function. Make me happy. Come on, make me happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just be happy. <laughs> oh. That's why I don't get too close to you all. Hey, does that work with Mike? Be happy. Just, yep. <laughs> walk away, Lee. Just walk away. Okay. That my joy may abide in you. Stay. Joy that is full and constant. Man, joy is not happiness. Joy is better than situational happiness. You can be just happy as a lark. Being really fine, I walk up kicking the shins. What happened to your happiness? Ah! That is fleeting. Joy can happen all the time. You say you can have joy when I kick you in the shins? Let's not test this. But yes, because you can be in a painful situation, you can be in a bad situation, you can be really, but you don't have to ever lose your joy. When was the last time you had an argument with somebody? What happened to your joy? Actually, the joy was long gone before you started the argument or even entered into the argument. She started it. I, I got you. Who started it? If you entered into it, how much are you abiding in love? Immediately, you're not, you're not thinking about the other person in love factors. You're thinking about what's right. Who's right? Neither one of you. You start, got into an argument. You're both wrong. And I can say that from the pulpit, but, you know, the husbands always say, the wives, you know, the wives, I'm always wrong. No, that's not always true. It's not just about the husband being wrong. It's husband and wife both being wrong if they are starting to interact without Jesus being the center. Okay. So here we have this vine, see, and it has a branch right there. See, well, what happens when the joy from the vine goes through the branch? Are we seeing a theme here? The outward expression is? Love. Joy. 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 <laughs> and your name is what? Miranda Joy. Hey, you should pick up on this. Boy, I tell you, there is, there are... Joy from the branch through the branch. Would you just calm down? Okay. Okay. John 14, 27, and we've gone over this before, says, I leave peace to you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be timid. The result of having the Spirit is having peace. We have His peace. Oh, do we? Well, it needs to be applied, doesn't it? We only get His peace when we're abiding in Him. Amen. See, kind of interesting. Trouble and fear is what I've allowed. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. Oh, so trouble and fear? Where'd it come from? I let it happen. I'm trying to go quicker here. Peace from the vine through the branch is an outward expression of? Yes, but she can be taught. Okay, outward expression of peace. Here we go. <laughs> Fruit of the Spirit. This is where Miranda was trying to go with this. But here's what I wanted you to see here. 
Love, joy, peace are explicitly shown as the only way you get it is by abiding in him. So what about long-suffering goodness and usefulness? I have a whole series on this. I got these trees hanging in the back of the, this whole thing. Yeah. Wait a minute. Where do we get these? By abiding in the vine. By abiding. Well, what, what about faith, meekness, and self-control? Any of these you want me to bring up by any chance just on the offshoot? I could just bring up the self-control one and just pretty much shoot down everybody in the room. How are we doing with our self-control? Are we abiding in his self-control? Eg kriteia is the Greek word. Eg meaning inner. Kriteia meaning do dominance. It actually means inner dominion. Where I am dominating on the inner man and not letting it run rampant. It affects my soul personally. I've got to have the fruit affecting my soul personally. And then it shows up for others to pick. I've got to be plugged into the vine for it to flow through me for it to be something that others can pick. It's the Spirit's fruit through me, His words and His works. How does this work? Well, we have a vine. And we have these branches, see? Well, if the Spirit from the vine goes through the branch and the outward expression is the fruit of the Spirit, it's still plugged in. Am I making sense this morning? Okay. For those Rocks Out students to say, where's your visual? Okay, right here. These are grapes. These are really good. <laughs> you pessimist. Are you just a pessimist or just fatalist? <laughs> Where do these come from? These come from the vine. They're good. Fruit that's not eaten, what happens to it? But the problem is, is this, that my fruit is still something that has to be available for somebody else. And it's also got to be something that brings life and nutrition to them and not just being sour. Okay, watch this. There's me and there's the Spirit. If I'm in Him and He is in me and we grow in that, then we can produce in others the fruit for others to pick. The whole idea here is that that's supposed to be the... Be the fruit of the Spirit, huh? It's not the fruit of Lee that they're picking. It's not the branch that they're picking. It's the, from the vine that they're picking, even though the branch is part. Kind of interesting, huh? It's what the branch is plugged into is the vine. What is the vine plugged into? All the life. The more I am connected to the vine, the more the life can flow to and through me. The more I'm connected. I must stay connected to the vine. Meno, stay, remain, abide, connected to the vine. I must submit to the pruning process. I gotta get the things out of my life that is keeping the thing from flowing. I've got to do it. He is living in me. Now, I've done this almost every week. Everybody should be able to fill out the whole rest of this, right? He is loving in me. Oh, I also threw this in. He is joying in me. <laughs> you say, that's a word? It's good enough for me. How about this one? He is piecing in me. I didn't know how to spell this one. I didn't know. Okay, this is a, okay, this is a. But what is it? He is doing the living. He is doing the love. He is doing the joy. He is doing the peace. He is all of these. When I'm in him, I get them. Through me. He is doing this through me. But I got to get it first. The more I yield, the more he can do. Am I letting him do what he wants to do? Okay. Oh, Lord, overwhelm my life. Are we getting it? Okay. This thing is amazing to me. Where are we going with it? How's your walk with Jesus? What's it like Wednesday mornings? What's it like during the week are you spending time in his presence, plugging into him? Are you actually asking the questions, Lord, what do you want to prune off of my life? You know, that's dangerous praying. Oh, that's dangerous praying. You know why? 
Because he's standing there with a pair of shears just, just going, ask me. Why? Because he wants the stuff off of you. He is convicting. What happens when you don't respond to conviction? Come on, you've all been there. You've all done it. Doesn't it kind of intensify? And it makes it so you don't want to spend time in his presence because every time you go into his presence, what's he saying? You got to get rid of this. Folks, I don't, I'm not going to blow you smoke and think that our walk with Jesus is all just super, just, you know. That's Sesame Street. Nothing bad happens on Sesame Street. But, man, I'm telling you, God takes things in my life and he rips into my life. Okay. How are you walking? How's your walk with him? What is your life like? We get one more installment on this next week. Because I got something this last week about, oh, and look how this, and I'm just like, one more. And then we're done for a while. I'm just sowing this into our lives. I want everybody to close your eyes for a second. As we've been talking about this abiding in him, what's it showed up in your life? I want you to look at him. Look at Jesus. He's there. His presence is right here in the room. I want you to be able to look in the spirit realm and see him. I want you to sense from him. Is he mad? Is he just trying to rip your life up? Is that what he's trying to do? Or does he love you? And is he trying to save your life? What's happening right now between you and him? Where do we stand? Oh, Lord. Is he Lord? How's your obedience factor? How's your love factor? How's your joy factor? How's your peace factor? What's happening in your life right now? Lord, I, I just pray that you'd come to each person here. Lord, show them right now what things are in their life, how much you love them. But Lord, also what things have come between you and them and help them understand it. Each one of us, Lord, thank you for what you're doing. May we walk in your life. Thank you, Father. Lord, we just give you praise and glory for all of this. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, amen.